Los Angeles breeze calling all cars, attention all cars. Sheriff's car pay particular attention. A murder. The body of a young woman found in the Mojave Desert near Lancaster. That's all. Rose and Quirk. just any gasoline. Do advertising claims for quick starting, mileage, pickup, power, or confusing technicalities influence you in your purchase? Rio Grande offers primarily one important fact. Rio Grande Crack gives you police car performance in your gasoline. That is why in the great southwest, where Rio Grande products are sold, so many police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment are powered by Rio Grande Crack. Police performance in the gasoline demands all the qualities you hear or see advertised. Quick starting, pickup, power, mileage, uniform quality. When you buy Rio Grande Crack, you know that all the best work and all the test work on gasoline has been done for you by those to whom gasoline quality means most and the overwhelming approval of Rio Grande Crack by police and fire departments is your proof that you cannot buy a better gasoline for your car. Buy Rio Grande Crack for dependable, satisfying performance, and it will settle your gasoline problem for good. And now, Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Good evening, friends. At the annual convention of the International Association for Identification, just closed at Long Beach, the Los Angeles Police Department Bureau of Identification was voted the most efficient of its kind in the United States. This bureau was organized several years ago under the direction of Captain Howard L. Barlow, who shares with me his enthusiasm for an international fingerprint system which will place in the files of the federal government fingerprints of all criminal types readily accessible to law enforcement agencies. At the same time, it will provide an identification of all citizens, making possible quick identification of them for their families and for officers of the law when they are made the victims of criminals. The story I bring to you tonight is one which will, I believe, convince all who hear it of the crying need for a universal fingerprint system. Had it not been for our identification bureau, perhaps the murder of the unfortunate Ida Mae Cerny would never have been punished. I want you to listen carefully, following with our police officers along the thin thread of evidence which brought to justice this murder. I want you to visualize the difficulty encountered by your peacetime soldiers in running down a definite enemy of society. I believe as this story unfolds, you will become more and more conscious of how important it is to keep fingerprint identification of all persons on file against the time it is needed to track down a criminal or save an innocent citizen from dire disaster or the ignominy of a nameless grave. Professor Lindsley will now go on with the story. It is the 22nd of October in 1932. In the Los Angeles County Sheriff's substation at Lancaster, in the Mojave Desert, 
A summer langer still lingers on the hot breezes coming across the sagebrush. Flies buzz against the screen, and nothing it seems ever happens in the sleepy little desert town. When suddenly the siesta silence is broken as a wild-eyed desert rat rushes into the office. Hey, Mr. Sheriff, I gotta see the sheriff right away. Uh, are you the sheriff? Uh, no, no, I'm deputy in charge here. The sheriff's in Los Angeles. Yeah, what's the matter? I just found a dead woman up the road. Huh? A dead woman? Where? Uh, up the road, about five miles on the turnoff to my old ranch. Uh, who are you? Uh, my name is Fred Storm. I'm on my feet a little uh, late. I got a job up there. And about a month ago, I tore down this shack I had down the road. It was a mining claim, and there was nothing on it. Well, so how about the dead room? I'm coming to that. So I forgot the nail bar at the shack, and I'm going to leave it myself a little late. So I stopped by the shack to get it. When I turned up the road, well, here was this dead woman with no clothes on. Uh, are you sure she was dead? Oh, yeah, she was dead, all right. Uh, where is this? Place. Well, it's, it's about five miles north and a half a mile east of the main road. Yeah, uh, uh, show it on the map. Yeah, well, let's not say if it's, uh, yes, or, uh, yeah, yeah, here, 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 right here. Uh, oh, well, that's over in San Bernardino County. Now, I'll call Sheriff Sharp right away. <laughs> San Bernardino County officers lose no time in getting to the scene of the crime. Swan's story is found to be true, and no suspicion is cast on him regarding the murder. For murder, it is found to be when Dr. Luisa Bacon of the San Bernardino County Hospital reports that the victim came to her death as the result of a multiple linear fracture at the hand of a person or persons unknown. However, there is no clue to the identity of the murdered woman, and police are momentarily stopped in their search for the murderer by their ignorance of the identity of the person murdered. The victim is totally unclothed, and the only clues found at the scene of the crime are tire marks, which, although possibly valuable in later identifications, are worthless as a beginning. There remains one meager hope on which the police rely. They fingerprint the dead woman and send the print into the Los Angeles Sheriff's Office to be checked. It isn't long before Deputy Sheriff Brewster of Los Angeles County has Sheriff Shaw of San Bernardino on the long-distance phone. Sheriff, we've identified that murder victim. Who is she? Her name is Ida Mae Cerny. Oh, she had a record, eh? No, yeah, not exactly. In 1930, we arrested her and her husband, Gus Cerny, on suspicion of robbery. Mm-hmm. They'd been friends of a guy we had for a holdup. Oh, I see. They cleared themselves okay, and we released them. Now we've located Cerny's sister and her husband here in Los Angeles. We've got his address. Mm-hmm. The sister hasn't seen either of them for three weeks, but uh, here's a tip you can run down. Uh, what's that? Uh, Cerny's mother lives in San Bernardino. She does? Yeah. What's her address? Uh, just a minute, I'll get it for you. I'm going to send one of the boys down to talk to her right away. <laughs> Deputy Sheriff Oxnivet and Farley promptly visit Gus Cerny's mother. They explain their mission and show the old lady a picture of Ida May's body. She looks at it a long time in silence. Well, ma'am? It, it might be Ida May. Oh, no, no, it can't be her. Why, I had dinner with Gus and Ida May just two weeks ago. They were both well and happy, and besides, her sister lives just two doors from the children's. And she would have notified me if there was anything wrong with you. How long has your son been married to this girl? Why, about three years. What's his business? Well, he's a telephone lineman by trade. Does he drive a car? Yes, uh, a blue Chrysler. License number? License number. I don't know it. Uh, We want to get to the bottom of this, ma'am. I wonder if you'd come with us to Victorville and look at the body. Why, yes, if you want me to. Oh, but I'm sure the poor girl is not Ida May. But the mother-in-law's conviction disappears in the mortuary in Victorville. And just before she faints, 
He positively identifies the murder victim as Ida Mae Cerny. Next day, the responsibility of the investigation of the crime passes to the Los Angeles Police Department when Deputy Sheriff William Bright, during a visit to the Cerny's home, discovers evidence that the crime was committed there. Within a half hour, Inspector Davidson and Lieutenant Philippus joined Bright at the little house on Laclede Avenue. Well, Captain, here we are. What's first? Your case, Inspector. Yeah. Well, there's no sign of murder here in the living room. Perhaps not, but look into the bedroom here. Good Lord. Shambles. Hmm. Uh, come on, just go over this room for fingerprints. Finger? You want these blood-stained bed sheets for analysis? Yeah. I'd better cut away sections of this woodwork, too. Oh, well, go ahead. Looks like whoever did it dumped out the contents of the suitcase from the way those clothes are strewn around the bed. Yeah, it looks that way. Hmm. Yeah, here's a cushion from a rumble seat. Uh, it's getting easier to reconstruct this crime every minute. If I read your thoughts, whoever did it killed her here and put the body into the rumble seat of the car and drove it out of the desert. That's about it. Well, I don't know whose car you'll be looking for, but here's a line on one car. What's this? A payment notice from the finance company for monthly installments on Cerny's car. You wouldn't be looking for that one, would you, Inspector? Well, you never can tell, Captain. You never can tell. It'd be a good thing to get the license number from the finance company anyway. I'd sort of like to talk to Cerny. Well, in any case, you'll want to talk to Ida May's cousin. Cousin? Yeah. Where's she live? Just two doors down the street. While the fingerprint expert and the photographer are taking care of the routine matters at the Cerny residence, Inspector Davidson interviews Ida May's cousin. Why, I talked to Ida May on the night of the 18th. She and Gus were getting ready to go to Palm Springs to look for work, and she wanted to borrow a cord for her electric iron, so I lent it to her, and I told her to bring it right back, but she didn't, and I needed it to make calls uh, in the morning. Just a minute, ma'am. Uh, you didn't see her after the 18th? No. I sent a boy over after the cord, but there was no one at home, so I suppose she'd gone off to Palm Springs like she said she was going to do. Oh, weren't you worried when you didn't hear from her? Oh, no. Gus and Ida may often went away and stayed a week without writing to anyone. Did they ever fight with each other? No. They always seemed very happy together. Oh, but I heard an argument once. Oh? Well, not really a fight, but Gus couldn't understand why Ida may didn't try to get some of the money that was coming to her from an estate or I don't know something. Oh, you've inherited some money, eh? Well, oh, yes, but, oh, you know, it was tied up in some way or another. And Gus thought she should try to get it right away because they were both broke. Well, of course, it's none of my business. But I... Well, Focus, there's a possible motive in this inheritance business. It may be that Ida May came into some money and Gus killed her for it. Yes, that's a possibility, Inspector. I've obtained a number of Gus Cerny's cars from the finance company, and I've wired all the inspection stations at the borders of the state to be on the lookout for him. Until he shows up to prove his innocence, he looks like the guilty party to me. Well, I can't find any other possible suspects in the case. Uh, I want you to go out and interview this attorney. Uh, here's his name and address. He's supposed to be handling Ida May's inheritance. See what he knows about it and report back to me as soon as you can. Yes, sir. <laughs> What does it consist of? Well, an aunt of hers died some time ago in Eaton, Ohio, and left her a tidy little sum, several thousand dollars, which she was to get when she became 21. Yes. Well, Mrs. Cerny came to me recently and asked me to try to get her an advance of $800. Uh, 400 of this was to be put into the down payment of their car and the remainder to be used for monthly payments. Was Mr. Cerny aware of this? Oh, yes, yes. Matter of fact, he was quite agreeable to it. That is, uh, to the down payment, but I believe they had some argument about the use of the other 400. Is that so? Uh, yes. <laughs> it seems uh, Cerny wanted to use it for living expenses, and 
Adam May insisted that he should try harder to get some work. <laughs> well, was she in possession of any large sum of money at the time of her death? Mm, no, not to my knowledge. Uh, that is, uh, certainly not from the estate. Thank you, Mr. Shoemaker. What you've told us clears up one angle of the investigation. <laughs> Silkus travels to the scene of the crime, accompanied by San Bernardino deputy sheriffs and the photographer. Minutely, they investigate the wheel tracks made by the murder car. There's a big difference in the tracks of these two rear tires. Notice, Sheriff, that although they're worn smooth in the center, you can see the bead at the side. See, the right rear has a sort of a knobby tread, and the left rear has a diamond-shaped one. Uh, that's right, Lieutenant. Uh, we can only find a blue Chrysler Roadster. It'll be a cinch to spot it by the tires. But why he went to such an effort to cart the body all the way out here is beyond me. Well, Lieutenant, any desert rat should tell you that. Why, what's the answer? Simple. See these prints in the sand here around the spot where the body was found? Yes. How they track. Mm. They live north there on those low hills. The wind was fortunately coming from that direction up until the time we found the body. And then it shifted to the south and the coyotes came. Now, if the wind had been right, the murderer of that woman would be beyond any possibility of capture. Or all that would have been left here would be a pile of bones. Upon his return to headquarters, Silkus is summoned to Inspector Davidson's office. I just received word from you, my is that our blue Chrysler Roadster, license number 1Z8106, takes through there at 4 a.m. October 20th. Good. Who was driving it? Yeah, they don't take the names down there anymore. They ought to make our work easier. But according to the investigations you've made, what city is this attorney lived in? Just a minute. I've got the list here someplace. Yeah, here it is. He's lived in Chicago, Miami, Denver, Oklahoma City, El Paso, San Antonio, Ames, Iowa, and Heron, Illinois. All right. Send a telegram to the chief of police in each of those cities asking him to arrest Gus Turney for murder. <laughs> effort to discover more definitely what Cerny's destination might be, Silkus once more interviews Gus's brother-in-law. Well, Mr. Harris, we've gotten word that Gus's car went through Yuma on the morning of the 20th. Well, that looks bad, doesn't it? The newspaper we found in the house on the Cleed Street was dated the 18th. That would seem to establish a murder around that date. Two days later, he leaves the state. Anyway, we've asked the police in every town he's lived in to be on the lookout for him to arrest him for murder. Well, if he did this thing, I want to see him brought back and prosecuted to the fullest extent. We police officers seldom meet an attitude like that, Mr. Harris. Well, what do you mean? Well, blood is thicker than water. Yes, I know. Of course, Gus is only my brother-in-law. But when I say I want to see him answer for this crime if he did it, I speak for my wife as well as Gus's other brothers. Well, that's fine, Mr. Harris, and it's going to make our job easier. Now, tell me, is there any more light you can throw on this case? Well, there's one thing that you might want to know. What's that? It's something the family had agreed to keep quiet about. Mm-hmm. Several years ago, Gus married a girl named Mary Young in Carbondale, Illinois. Later, he deserted her and her baby and came to California. He met Ida May and married her in Tijuana. About three months ago, Gus and Ida May went east for a visit. Now, I don't know whether Ida May found out about it then or not. But when Gus came back, he said he was afraid Mary's family would make trouble for him and Ida May. So, he's a bigamist in any case. Yes, I guess that's right. Well, thanks for that piece of dope, Mr. Harris. We'll wire Carbondale and find out if he's been there. Bill Cook wires Carbondale authorities, and two days later, he excitedly enters Davidson's office. Well, Inspector, the trail's getting hot. What do you got? Telegram from the chief of Carbondale. What does it say? Gus Sunny here, October 23rd. Left, same night. Believed headed for Chicago. Good. Where are the Chicago police? Now, wait a minute, Inspector. Hmm? They're not sure he's headed for Chicago. And anyway, we've already asked Chicago as well as those other towns to look for him. Well? I found out today that Gus Sunny borrowed $10 from a gang foreman when he couldn't get his paycheck on the 19th. He's hard up. He's going to wire his family here for money as sure as I'm a day old. Fine. 
Then in that case, make arrangements with Western Union to send us any telegrams addressed to any members of the Cerny family. Well, but the family will cooperate. Mr. Harris said he'd let us know just as soon as they got work. Just the same, Filkers. We don't depend on that. Line up the Western Union and get any telegrams that are coming before they do. Later, a telegram arrives in Los Angeles addressed to Sir Ney's brother and requesting him to send $10 to Gus at a certain Western Union office in Chicago. Two hours before the telegram is delivered to see, it is in the hands of the Los Angeles police. And by the time it's delivered, Chicago police have been tipped off and are staked out on the indicated Western Union office. The vigil of the two detectives is finally rewarded when a blue Chrysler Roadster pulls up before the telegraph office. The officers watch it from their car. Well, there's a blue Roadster. Chrysler, too. Yeah, with California plates. Yeah, check the number. 1Z8106. Mm-hmm. That ought to be him. Well, let's uh, get a, let him get into the office and claim his telegram. Okay. He's going in now. We better move toward the door. All right. Come on. <coughs> Looks like our man, all right. Answer the description. Yeah, that's the guy. What did he do, Ed, do you know? Yeah. Bumped off his wife, according to the lieutenant. What's criminal about that? I know a lot of wives that ought to be bumped off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here he comes. Okay. What's his name? Shirley. Shirley. Huh? All right. You're under arrest, Shirley. What? You're under arrest. Oh, what for? You're wanted for murder in Los Angeles. Oh, there's some mistake. Well, we can talk that over down at the detective bureau. We got orders to bring in, so you better come along peaceably. Oh, okay. Let's go. Gus Cerny maintains an uncommitting silence, he agrees to sign a waiver of extradition. Lieutenants Baggett and Silkus are appointed state agents by District Attorney Buren Pitt and sent to Chicago to bring Cerny back. Less than a week later, Silkus and Baggett face Cerny in the Cook County Jail. Well, I'm sort of glad to see you guys. The accommodations in this jail aren't exactly the same as the Palmer House. Yeah, I guess that's right, Cerny. Have a good trip, Gus? Yeah, okay. I made pretty good time. Did your car hold up okay? Yeah, worked like a dream. Any tire trouble? Nope. Well, that is just one flat at Cobden, Illinois. And all the tires that were on your car when you left California are still on it, hmm? Yeah, that's right. But listen, fellas, what do you care about tires? You came after me, apparently. What do you want me for? Come on, let me in on it. Well, let's not go into that tonight, Gus. You're tired and so are we. Go back to your cell. We'll talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> with Cerny's admission that the blue Chrysler carries the same tires with which it had left California, the two detectives investigate the car the next morning. Now, let's see. The left rear was the diamond tread. It isn't on the car. Take a look at the spare. That might be the one he changed. Yeah, here it is, diamond tread. Same as the facts in the desert. Now about the right rear. I've got no on it. This is the car, all right. Okay, now let's get a look at that rumble seat. Hmm, cushion's gone. Check another time. Like it while I'm looking around this rumble seat, see if there's a tool kit in the car. Right. Yeah, here's one in the pocket. Fine, and look what I found. What? Under the mat in the rumble seat, blood stain. Say, that guy must be nuts leaving all this evidence around. Let's see what's in that tool kit. Okay. Wrench, tire pump, screwdriver. Uh oh. What's that? Looks like a lineman's tool. Certainly was a lineman, wasn't he? Yep. And look at it, stained with blood. That's what he killed her with. Sonny is as good as swinging right now. Silkus and Baggett lose no time getting back to the jail to interview Sonny. Well, Gus, we're ready to talk to you now. Well, what do you want? What's it all about? We're going to question you about the disappearance of your wife, Ida May, and your sudden departure from Los Angeles at the same time. Well, what do you want to know? Well, we already know that you killed your wife as she lay in bed in the house on Laclede Street. And we know you threw the cushion out of the rumble seat of your roadster, threw her body in, and then drove out to the desert and left her body where you thought it'd never be found. Now we want the whole story, Gus, if you choose to tell us. If you don't, we've got enough to hang you anyway. Well, I, I guess you got me. I may as well tell you everything. You understand that whatever you say now will be used against you in court. I understand. Why did you kill her? 
I don't know. Did you kill her with this pair of pliers? I don't know. I, maybe. I, I always kept a kit of tools in the kitchen. Maybe that's what I used. When did you do it? About 10 or 11 o'clock on the 18th, just after we went to bed. I was going to give myself up. I drove down to the city hall and sat outside for an hour or more, trying to get up enough guts to go in and do it. Was the body in the car then? Yeah. Why didn't you give yourself up? I don't know. What did you do after you left the city hall? Well, I drove out into the desert. I sat on the running board of the car out there for a long time, trying to figure out what to do. And, and finally, I took her out and left her there in the desert. Then what'd you do? I went back to San Fernando and tried to get my paycheck. And I couldn't. I borrowed $10 from the foreman, and then I went back to the house... Well, I packed my bag and I left for Yuma. I drove straight through and stopped in Carbondale to see Mary, my wife. When did you marry her? Who, Mary? Yeah. Oh, about eight years ago. You ever been divorced from her? No, sir. Did you go through a marriage ceremony with Ida May and Tijuana? Yes. Knowing at the time you weren't divorced from Mary? Yes. Is it true that you feared revenge from Mary or her family because you were bigamously married to Ida May? Where did you hear that? Never mind. Is it true? Now, you've been talking to Harris. That's what I told him. Is it true? Oh, no, Mary wouldn't do anything to me. Why, she's the sweetest girl in the world. She's been willing to take me back. Why did you kill Ida I May? I don't know. Was it because you wanted to return to Mary and your child? I don't know. I tell you, I don't know. I did it and I've confessed. Don't let me alone. But I don't know why I did it. <laughs> Gus Cerny continued to claim that he didn't know why he killed Ida May. He never has confessed his motive. But motives did not concern us with such a splendid case our officers had constructed. Silkus and Baggett brought Gus back to Los Angeles, and he was booked at the Los Angeles County Jail on November 29, 1932. A few days later, the grand jury indicted him on a murder charge. He pleaded not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity, and repudiated his confession. We had expected that, but we were confident in our case. Apparently, he saw how strong it was, for on January 9, 1933, he withdrew his plea of not guilty and fell back on the insanity defense. On February 14, having changed counsel, he withdrew the insanity plea and threw himself on the mercy of the court. That was a wise move and saved his life, for Judge Aguilar sentenced him to serve the remainder of his natural life in San Quentin Prison. Thank you, Chief Davis. emergency equipment in your cities and counties depend upon Rio Grande cracked gasoline, so the internationally known Sinclair Oil are used and approved by public service companies and corporations whose judgment on lubricating oils you may well respect. Your Navy uses 1,600,000 gallons of Sinclair Oil for protection of their motors and fighting equipment. Your Army depends upon Sinclair Oil for the lubrication of their trucks, tanks, guns, and other costly machinery. 52 railway systems fight friction and wear with Sinclair oil. 150 airlines, airplane manufacturers, and flying fields have tested, approved, and now use Sinclair oil. For your own sake, don't buy cheap bulk oil when you can buy Sinclair Opaline in sealed, tamper-proof, extra-measure cans for only 25 cents a quart. It will save you money and save your motor. The new radio log for August is now available, containing a complete list of forthcoming cases to be broadcast on Calling All Cars and another Rio Grande program. Drive into your neighborhood Rio Grande service station tomorrow and ask for the August radio log. It's free.
Wilkinson is pleased, calling all cars, attention all cars. Cancellation broadcast 37 regarding a murder. Suspect in this case now in custody. That's all. Rolls and quits. based on the confidential files of the Los Angeles Police Force and is written and produced by William N. Robeson. The orchestra is under the direction of Frederick Stark. And this is Frederick Lindsley.